right, so when you're making cups and saucers, what's that um, weight of the clay? Um, it all depends on the size. These seem extremely large, right? But clay shrinks, remember that? So these are gonna be not small cups and saucers. And that last one I showed you of Carl Borgeson's work, you saw the smaller ones and you saw the larger ones. The scale of your cups and saucers is not necessarily something I'm dictating to you. you you're gonna think about it, okay? Um, the idea of proportion is something I'm gonna talk about. And so I did three basic ones and three saucers. One of the saucers is bigger because the diameter of this cup is bigger and I wanna play with that proportion. So when you look at influence, what cup and saucer sets are you looking at in the contemporary sense or commercial sense or historical sense? And how large is that saucer compared to it? What is the purpose of that saucer? Again, is it for tea and crumpets or is it just for the spoon and some sugar cubes? You know, what is that saucer for? The scale then might be something is going to be dictated by the actual utility of that object, right? So I did different forms. This one's going to be a little less rounded. This one's going to be trimmed away and be more rounded. And so the, the three examples of finished ones there I have, you'll see different shapes. So what is the shape of the saucer and the shape of the cup? How do they reference each other? In these, they're all kind of the same basic saucer form. Can you play with that? Yes. 465 students, maybe more so, again, than 365. So one of my professors said, keep it simple, stupid, because I'd always complicate things before I had the knowledge to complicate things. So right now, if you feel like you're a little challenged, then don't complicate it so much. Try and keep it really simple. And not that simple is bad. Simple can be harder to do well. Even. So for these, I'm using about a pound and a quarter of clay. On the pugs, because you'll be pugging your clay, if you cut those off a certain size, you can think about that as a way to um, actually have some consistency in your form. And those of you in 365, it's really imperative that you continue to um, go ahead and think about that consistency as a friend. 465 also. But you want to think about the fact that how much do you get out of a pound? How much do you get out of three quarters of a pound? How much do you get out of a half a pound? Those are things that if you don't know what scale you're getting of that cup you're making or that saucer you're making, then you're not going to ever know what you really can get out of that clay. And you're going to have heavier pieces or more to trim away and all of these different things. So being consistent is important. So when I look at this, I'm going to say for this piece, I want pound shaped, maybe it's uh, two inches or so on this pug, and I'm not going to care too much about consistency. Okay? So, um, the cups, is, those are some, that's something that you all know already. You've already done that in Ceramics 1. So you know about how to make cups, but I'll go over the basics of trimming cups and making cups that you're going to trim compared to just flat bottom cups that you may have made. Um, and so with that said, there's two ways to do it. One is to just throw it off the wheel, like you've already done. And the other is to use a bat. And so, how many people have used bats in here already? So, you're using bat pins or bat patties. There's different ways to approach it. Not all the wheels in the studio have holes for bat pins. So, I want to teach you how to use a bat patty, too. Can you hand me um, two small bats from up there? So, the size of the bat, determines the size of the bat patty, too. No, just the two little teeny ones, yeah. So because I'm making cups and space is limited, you'll see some people using square bats that fit into a, a actual bat that kind of stays on the wheel. But these little bats are fine for, and it's nice to put your damn bat back and have it clean. Um, so I'll just demo this once. But making a bat patty the size of the clay that you need is one thing. What you want is a bat patty to be approximately a little less than a half an inch. But if it's a quarter inch off the wheel head, it's not going to work very well. So it's going to be hard to pop the bat off and reuse that patty over and over. So the patty is basically a plate. For those of you who haven't thrown plates yet, you kind of need to make them on bats too. Throwing these off a bat, again, is the only way I would suggest in the beginning here for you not abusing your saucers. Um, you can throw your saucers off the hump too, and you can throw your cups off the hump too. Past that purple 
cup around and look at the bottom. That was thrown off the hump. And that's me doing it. As a teeny S-crack, right? Notice the S-crack. You guys will have a larger S-crack. I can teach you how to try and get rid of that. I have out of 100 cups, probably five S-cracks. So you probably have more. So S-cracks are not a good thing. You don't want cracks on the bottom of your cup. Can you all answer me maybe one way you might get an S-crack on your piece? Not really. Uh, yes, yeah, standing water in the bottom of your piece. Not what? compressing it. Not compressing it. Those are the two major ones. So if you're leaving water in the bottom of your piece, that's not a good thing, right? So I would say making sure as you're making your piece that you're not filling it like a lake with water, you know? You want to use the right amount of water, okay? All right, so I have centered that piece of clay, and I'm using my palm, the knife edge here, to go ahead and get it parallel with the wheel head. Then I will further, after I feel like it's close enough, I will kind of clean it off because I don't want all this gooey slop on there. The bat will um, probably slide around. A plastic bat will slide around more than these wood bats or plaster bats. The type of material the bat's made out of is something to take into account when you start utilizing bats. But I'll clean it off like that. And cleaning it off is doing two things. It's making it so that bat won't slip but it's also getting it more parallel because this tool is better than my hand. The knife edge of this uh, wooden rib is going to really kind of even out any little bumps. So you want to do that. Now, there are two different ways to create kind of this vacuum that the bat patty is going to uh, put on the bat. You know, you're going to put the bat down. It's going to kind of create this vacuum. You can put an X in it or you could do these circles and you're going to, after you clean it off, just go ahead and take the point of your rib and dig into it like that. And that should be enough for this bat to, to rest on there. Now because, again, this one is this material, you want to maybe not just put it on there as a dry uh, piece, but you would never do this to a plastic one. So two different ways to approach because of the material the bat is made of. So loosely center it, eyeball it uh, on there, and then give it a little a little whack. If your clay is really wet that you've um, put the bat patty down with, give it less of a whack. If it's a little harder, give it a little more of a whack. And then see how that fits. Go ahead and see if it moves a little. Doesn't. So it's fun. And that's the simple of how you get a bat on. Bat hole, these bats don't have holes in them. So you can't use bat pins. Some of the bats have holes, some of them don't. So learning to do bat patties is really kind of imperative. Those of you in 465 will be using bats as measuring devices too, along with calipers. So we're going to use calipers to measure the indentation in the saucer to get a sense of how the foot is going to be trimmed to fit in there. So I'm going to stick to this kind of diameter. And I'm using a, an object I already have. Some people will use paper and go ahead and make two marks, and then you'll have a consistent size foot that you trim all the time that fits with the saucers that you make. So there's different tricks to this, okay? Um, I just like go, well, I'll use that. So this is something I always have as a sponge. I'm gonna say, right, maybe so you use a bat for your cups because you throw them really thin or you have a form or a surface that you don't wanna touch, and that's another reason to use bats. So I'll throw a basic teacup Go ahead and center it. And when you open it, you're going to allow room for the floor of the piece to have about half an inch. That allows you to compress a little to have a little less than a half an inch. And then allows you enough to have uh, a foot the size that you want. What if you want your foot a lot higher? Then you make it an inch thick. You will have more compression issues with the thicker bottom. David Shainer taught me a trick. When I'm trimming it, I'll show you that trick. So that'll be on Monday, I'll trim a bunch of pieces. And there's a trick to keep S-cracks from forming. Also, if you're throwing off the hump, bouncing your thumb in there, and you can probably hear that over there. It's kind of slapping against that surface and it's compressing it. I'm not throwing off the hump right now. I actually have a bat, so it's pushing against a hard surface. It's the clay in my thumb pushing against that bat. Whereas off the hump, when I show you that, when I do the uh, saucer off the hump, 
we've got to be concerned about that. So is the floor of my piece uh, more bowl, or is it, has it got this kind of angle? These are things when I open it up, those of you who did just basic tumblers and stuff, you open it up straight, but you also made bowls. And you remember that curvature that you do when you open up that form. And so I did a, more of a curved one because I'll make a, a teacup that's got more of a curve to it. So in your first pull, you still are going down, even though the floor isn't down there at the bat, you're still using the clay down at the bat. You don't want a big lump of clay down there. And on your second pull, maybe you shape it a little bit. Third pull, whatever, I mean, I do it in about two pulls. So you do it in maybe three or four pulls. If it's taking you eight pulls to make that cup, you're spending way too much time. So I still want to get that clay off of there. I might as well trim some of it now with my ribs. So I did that. And then I'm going to shape it from the inside to the outside against my rib to clean off and compress that surface too. So if I want to give this even more of a curvature, after I've thrown it and gotten the walls nice and even, I might go in and put my fingers in or a curved bowl rib in there and push from the inside to the outside. And you'll see that belly out. So you can see it gave it a little more curvature down there. But from about here down, I'm going to trim. So I can continue that curve in my trimming and have it flow in as that one example there had it flow into the foot, the middle one, or that one too. The last step on most cups, again, the most important thing is you remember that a cup is something that touches your lips. And you don't want something rough. So if you've sponged your lips a bunch, you might have grog on the surface of that clay. So try not to sponge them. Um, try to just compress it with your fingers and smooth off that lip. But using a piece of paper, I mean plastic, smooth plastic, or a chamois, um, those are ways to get that lip to be really glossed over and be better on my lip. That's really important if you're doing any soda firing or wood firing. It's, you're going to glaze it. The glaze is going to smooth that lip up too. But if it's a really thin glaze, you still you don't want a bunch of grog kind of poking through the glaze. All right, so the benefit of this, again, is that it's on a bat. I don't have to touch it. Again, that's more important for your saucers, although I'm showing you off the hump with the saucer. How to pop your bat off, that's why you need to have it at least you know about that high with the patty. To use my rib, I prop it up under there, and I just pop it off. Sometimes the plastic bats are harder to get off than the actual uh, masonite or wood bat. All right, so the actual saucer, I mean, if you're throwing out the hump and you're doing 10, you would probably put five pounds on here, you know, or more, and you could throw, you could throw all day off the hump. You could keep adding to the hump of clay, but I'm just going to demonstrate one saucer here. This could be done on the bat, and I suggest that for you, but if you want to try saucers off the hump, I'll do one right now, and I'll think about that compression thing. One of my teachers, Chuck Hines, would use a chair leg. And hit it with this ball end on a chair leg, and that would compress it. He almost never got asked credits. So. Do you prefer throwing the saucers off the hump like that? I don't. I, I, I prefer just throwing on bats for saucers, but I'm just going to say that there's no one way to do things. There's a, a wrong way or a right way? Nah, not really. There's just a way that works for you. And I think what works for beginners primarily is that throwing them off the hump is you're more apt to maybe have them potato chip on you a little. And I don't want mine to be potato chipped. So what I mean by potato chips is like they're curved, they bend, and I don't want a bendy saucer. I want it to be pretty solid. Do you so, typically throw the saucers first and then decide how you're going to want your foot on the cup? Or do you throw the cup first and then the saucer? Well, that's a really good question. It doesn't matter to me, actually. But I get an idea in mind of a form, maybe a basic um, saucer form like this. Again, this is the area where the foot's going to be. And although I didn't measure it, I neglected to say measuring it, that measurement is dead on there. I just get used to a certain size foot for a certain size cup. I would say that you're thinking about stability. You want your feet to be well grounded. And so proportionately, this foot for something this big would be tippy. 
but the proportion of this foot for something that big is sufficient. So I gave it an undercut there, I left enough clay, and throwing it off the hump, you didn't see a potato chip. You don't see it like bending, even if I'm even holding it longer here. But that's gonna make, I'm gonna have to trim a lot of that away there, you know. Um, I'll have enough room for a foot. How tall is the foot? What is the diameter of the foot on the saucer twos? Is another thing to think about. And you've already dictated this space for that foot to sit. So think about trimming in a variety of ways. You're always trying to kind of match the exterior with the interior of the form. So any questions? Yes. It has to do with trimming, but what's a good, I know that a lot of people have different ways, but what's a good way to, to know where you're at with, you know, when you're like trimming the basement to not go through? That's, like, that's, that's kind of coming in with that muscle memory too. You start to realize what the interior and exterior is and where you're at. But there is the needle tool that you can take it off and stick it in and see how far the needle tool goes in. When you take it off, you oftentimes right away know that it's heavier than you want it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, what I've suggested to a few of you who have yet to figure out how heavy things are is to say, does it feel full, right? I told you that once, right? Does it still feel full? Well, it shouldn't feel full. It's not full. Um, so you kind of feel it. So there's that. There's also tapping it, and it sounds like uh, there's a sound that you can get. And when I when I hear it, I can I can hear if it's consistent. Like this plastic is the same sound all the way around because it's you know it's plastic at this certain thickness. Mm -hmm. the clay will do the same thing. When you're trimming the clay, it'll be it should be at a, a leather hard stage, right? Those of you you all know how to trim. You trim at a leather hard stage, and you should be able to tap on it without burning the piece. And you can hear it go thud, 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 and it'd be a higher pitch where it's thinner and a lower pitch where it's thicker. So there's some people use sound. And when I'm doing really like 50 pound platters, I'll use sound for it. Because I don't want to take the platter off, have to then recenter the platter and trim it more because it's too heavy. So I use sound for the platters. Um, and you know, you can you can just say, once you do some uh, cups and some saucers, you get a sense of that physical thing, it's too heavy. If you don't know where that is, like a lot of you, it's hard for you to know, you know. So like I said, if it feels full, that's one thing. But with a saucer, you're like, hmm, feels good. Let me know. I'll look at it. I'll say, hey, you could trim it more. Another way with clay, one student so often I do, say cut it in half, you know. How long really did it take me to make that? Mm -hmm. Two minutes, you know. So if I'm not quite sure what I'm getting out of that amount of clay, then I can cut it in half and I can say, wow, it's a quarter inch everywhere, except the lip's a little thicker. Great, that's what I want. Or wow, it's really thick down here. Well, I can get a lot more out of this clay. And that's why it feels bottom heavy, because it's all down here. A tendency that you have clay one, two, three, four, five, and even some grad students sometimes, is to have it as a bottom heavy issue. So quite often, it's got problems with the bottom. So that's where you can kind of trim a little more trim a little more. I wouldn't trim up here because usually from like here up you're pretty consistent in your throwing as you start to get into the skill. Cool. Any other questions? Well, I'm sure others will arise. Again, don't hesitate to ask me.